Our text for today is uh, from John's short epistle, the first one. The first few verses, we'll look at that and then look at the implications of that for our lives as we look at them. And we read from 1 John 1. That which was from the beginning, which was we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testified to it, and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. A question that may be asked, as was brought up in the children's object lesson before, is what what is our life worth? What is the value to our life? We call ourselves followers, disciples, believers in Jesus Christ. So what what gives us worth, though, in, in the reality of how we function on a daily basis? Is it our job, our job title, our salary? The car we drive, the house we live in, the places we've gone to on vacation, what our kids have accomplished in school or athletics athletics or whatever it may be, in choir or band or choir, anything. Is it the goals we have achieved? The level of technology that we understand? We can look at all of these things and say they give some value to life, and indeed they do give value to life. Some things that we have accomplished, if you've been uh, uh, moving up within your company and you have done a good job of doing that, we should be proud of those things that we have accomplished, whatever that may be. At the same time, if we make all of our life and all of the value of our life to revolve around those things, then we're missing the greatest gift of all, the gift that comes from God. Jesus made this very clear as Luke recorded in his gospel. And he says that, and now as they went on their way, Jesus entered the village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into their house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. Mary sat at his feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me serve you alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the better way. And it will not be taken away from her. Mary has chosen what is better. As we look at that and we think about that, wait a minute, there's a contrast here. Martha is serving Jesus. I mean, after all, the Lord Jesus Christ is in her house and she wants to serve him well because of who he is and his position in life and as a son of God. Instead, Mary is not busy about serving him, but sitting and listening to him. And so Jesus says, Martha... That which Mary is doing is the better thing. John goes on to clarify this in his gospel, and he writes, as Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word and you are my disciples, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so John goes on to clarify what does it mean to abide in him, to have the good thing, to belief in the important thing is to hear his word and by staying in his word you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. There's something that comes from working with Jesus, listening to his word, listening to his teaching and then abiding in in it and as a result of that we will be free. And so he's saying that there's something else other than all my earthly entrapments it can be my car, my house, my job, my position, whatever it may be. So there's something more than that. 
There is this listening to Jesus, and we will know the truth, and as a result of that, we will be free. The question is then, when Jesus says, listen to my word, can we trust Scripture? Many people in the world around us and in our own country don't trust Scripture. They think it's just another book, just another story, just something that uh, is nice for those other folks, but not for me. So let's take a, a look at it and see what gives it its authority. Let's say this morning, if you said, John, uh, can you tell me what it's like to uh, float around in space as a part of International Space Center, and maybe perhaps take a, a trip out into space on a tether? Can I tell you about that? And I said, yeah, I could watch some videos of people doing that. I could read some books. I could look at some news accounts. Uh, I could even maybe talk to an astronaut, which I have had the benefit once in my life of actually talking to an astronaut who's been up there doing all of that. And so I could tell you something about it as a result of what I heard from somebody else. You say, well, well that's not exactly authoritative, because how do we know what you have heard is what the truth is? I could also respond this way. Uh, I had the privilege of, when I was in the seminary, of going to the Holy Lands for three weeks with a number of students from both of our seminaries. And part of that trip, we went to Egypt, so I've ridden on a donkey, and I've been in a pyramid, and I've seen the Sphinx, and uh, i have um, sad you don't swim in the Dead Sea. But if you say, can you tell me about Hezekiah's tunnel? I said, yeah, I can show you. There's a reference in the Bible about Hezekiah having this tunnel dug. And uh, I know why he dug it, because he was afraid that the Assyrians would come and attack the city. And so he wanted to hide the water source, which was outside of the city walls. And so he had a, a tunnel dug between the Gihon Spring and to the Pool of Ceylon inside of the city walls. And so there was a water source inside, so in case the enemy came, they would still have water inside the city. It's a very strategic and good planning. Well, while we were on this tour, uh, the bus driver stopped at Gahan Spring and said, uh, you know, you can walk through it if you want to. Some people do, and if you want to, say, all you got to do is kind of roll up your pants a little bit. It's not that deep, uh, and we'll pick you up on the other side in the Pool of Siloam. So there were a number of us who were courageous enough to say, yeah, we'll do that. I mean, after all, you're only there once. You've got to walk through the tunnel, right? And so we did. And then so we started in, and uh, wonderfully me, I took my camera, and my flashlight, had my billfold in my pocket, and we're walking along, as others were doing. And then at some point, despite the fact he said the water's never more than about knee deep, at one point in the tunnel, the water was up to our chin when our head was against the ceiling. There was about that much air. Uh, so it, and it was cold water, and the bottom was very slippery, because after all, it had been over 2,000 years that this tunnel was dug, and there had been water sitting in it, and it kind of got slippery. So the point being, if you ask me about Hezekiah's tunnel... I can speak to you with it a little bit more authority because I have experienced that myself. And so it is a, very much a part of my life. In fact, I can almost describe it as much today, perhaps like an astronaut could, of uh, being in space and what that's all about. So the point being, if you want to hear something from somebody who's authoritative, talk to somebody who's experienced it. If you want to know about what is it like to be in space, Talk to an astronaut who's been there, and he or she can share with you what they know about experiencing the very presence of being in outer space. Let's go back to our text for this morning. John wrote this, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. So he's saying, I heard with my ears, which we have seen with our eyes. He saw it with his eyes. And we have looked upon and have touched with our, touched, he touched Jesus Christ. He had it in his own ability to actually be in the presence and touch Jesus Christ. Concerning the words of life, the life was made manifest. He said, I know what it's like because I saw Jesus, I touched him, I heard him, and God's eternal life was made manifest in Jesus Christ right there in my own presence. We have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us now. And so John is saying to us, look, I am authoritative because I have seen and heard and touched and listened to. And then if we actually look at it even more closely, he not only listened to him, he ate with him. 
And they walked around with him perhaps for many, many months and weeks and heard his story. And if you read the Gospel of John, you would say there's probably hundreds, thousands more books could be written than what I've written here. And he acknowledges that because he took notes about what was going on. And so if you wanted to hear what it is to be in the presence of God, let's listen to John. And so he shares with us that message that he has seen and heard and touched. As such, then as we ask the question, what gives us value in life? We can look at our vocation, our cars, we've talked about all of that, but ultimately what gives us value in life is the fact that God said to us, you are my children. I love you and I forgive you and I give you life. If you do a chemical analysis of the human body, we have about six major components, some elements that we can count, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, and phosphorus, a few other things. And if we were able to harvest all of that out of our body, which is not possible because it's all over our body, we'd be worth a little bit less than $600. And so the question might be asked again, would you give your life for something worth $600? Uh, I'm not so sure about that. I don't think I would. Well, let me ask you this question. Would you give your life for something that was totally flawed and broken and incapable of performing great things that you would want them to do? And you say, hmm, I'm not sure about that. And yet, what does John tell us? I saw, I heard, I touched, I ate with, I lived with, the Messiah himself, who gives us eternal life. And so our ultimate value is given to us by God himself. And so there's three questions I'd like for us to look at this morning, our statements. One is, let the one who values you determine your worth. Let the one who values you determine your worth. We are in the midst of all this COVID stuff, and there's all kinds of things affecting people's lives. Some statistics say that even very young children, three, five years old, are experiencing anxiety and depression. Suicide and the thoughts of it are just ending life among teenagers is very high. And depression, anxiety, resentment, anger, strains on marriages. It's very, very great because there's so much else going on. We're trying to be parents and we don't have the answers to every question that comes up. In fact, even as I watched the news the other day, they said, stay tuned to the six o'clock news because what we know now may be changed by the time the news comes out a little bit later on. And that's the world in which we live. I know a number of clergy and I can think of our own pastors here Every one of them are trying to figure out, how do we do worship? What does it look like? Do we do it in person? Do we do it just live? Do we do it live stream? Do we, whatever. And then every church, and some of them are financially doing well. Others of them are closing because the finances are not there. It is a struggle. Like your businesses, your corporations. There's some of them going out of business while some of them are flourishing at this time. And so there's a lot of stress and anxiety, and we can let all of those things define us. And yet John comes back to us and says, let the one who loves you determine your value. Regardless of anything else, let God's love for you determine your value. Secondly, let your value that comes from God affect your behavior. In other words, when something happens, how do we respond and not react? In the midst of elevated anxiety, there's a propensity within all of us to just react, to blame, to find fault, to point the finger at somebody else and say, well, they did it. He didn't do it. He should have. She didn't. When you think of, I, I think of principals and teachers and uh, all the people who are trying to discern, how do we do teaching? And then the parents and children who are affected by all of that, everybody is in a sense of a quagmire of what's going on. And so what defines us? And so in the midst of all of that, how do we let our value of who God says we are define our behavior? One thought in doing that 
is what some people have done over the, I guess, perhaps centuries, is to have a breathing prayer. And as you look back at Genesis, when God created us, he breathed into us the breath of life. He breathed into us the breath of life. And so every time we breathe, inhale and exhale, and we all do it if we're watching this morning, then we have to acknowledge that the real life we have is because the breath of life that God gives us. And so a thought. When you're in a moment of, I don't know what to do, or before you react, before you blame, before you find fault, before you blame yourself, stop, slow down, and breathe. And as you breathe in, breathe in the breath of life, the breath that God gives us. Breathe in his grace, his mercy, his peace, his forgiveness. And then when you exhale, dump the stuff out there that is hindering your movement forward. As one psychologist calls them ants, automatic negative thoughts. If I had just only, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't be here now. And so we can play the blame game on self. We can also blame, put shame on ourselves. I'm not a good person. If I really loved like I was supposed to love, this wouldn't have happened. If I'd have done the right thing, that wouldn't have happened. And so we can blame ourselves. And so as you exhale, dump that stuff out. You're loved by God. Your ultimate value is because of what God has done for you. And as time goes on, if we can do that, if we can breathe in that breath of life, that forgiveness, that love, and cognitively and consciously think about that. And if you can dump that stuff out, in time, as James said very clearly, Lord, I ask you to write on my heart the royal law. Love my neighbor as myself. Love your neighbor as yourself. If I can have that as an eternal part of me, then not only will I inhale the blessings of God, the forgiveness, I can also exhale forgiveness, exhale love and grace and peace. And that changes everything because it affects a relationship with your spouse, your husband, your children. And this is not just for adults, this is for everyone. I, with young people, there can be a lot of blaming and a lot on Facebook and Twitter and other social media sites. There can be some cruelty that goes on. And we can begin to own it. We can say something's wrong with me and realize that the problem is somebody else is giving you their problem. Don't own it. Just say, my value is determined by God. My value is determined by the one who lived and died and rose again. Remember, John talked about that. He not only wrote about seeing him while he was still alive, he wrote about seeing him after he resurrected, that he ate with him, he spent time with him, he listened to him. And so we know from a first-hand knowledge that everything that we believe about him is true because John experienced it and the Apostle Paul experienced it and they write about it so you and I can know the truth and the truth will set us free. As we think about that, I'd like to just conclude with an example of what does it mean to let God's relationship with us define our behavior. As we look back in the book of Daniel, there's a wonderful story, so everyone just going to look at one of them. And there were three men that, basically, let's back up, that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar uh, went in and took from Judah all the prime young men who were in intelligent, good-looking, responsible, authoritative, and so he kidnapped them, in essence. He took them all over into his culture, his kingdom, and he redef tried to redefine them. He gave them new names. He tried to get them to worship different gods. He wanted to transform them 
and re-educate them in his way of thinking, and then he would elevate them to positions of authority. But three of the people that he did that with are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that is their new names, as they came over. And so they did these things at some level because they were in positions of authority. And then some people came to uh, Nebuchadnezzar in and, and his whole sense of his own need for authority. He built a gold statue 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. And then he declared that everyone, everyone, when you hear basically the band playing, if you read it in Scripture, there's a whole bunch of lyres and lutes and flutes and, and drums and everything else going on. When you hear the band playing, worship this God. And the punishment for not worshiping that God is being thrown into the fiery furnace. And so that was a decree, and everybody was to worship this new golden God. And then there were some people who really didn't like the Jews that Nebuchadnezzar had brought over, so they came up with this story, and it was a true one in one sense, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not worshiping that God. And so Nebuchadnezzar said, oh, okay, let's, let's talk to them, bring them in. So he brought them in to hear their story, and this is what Scripture says they reported. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. So he says, I'm not going to worship your God. We're not going to worship your God. And besides that, our God can deliver us from this fire. So we're really not afraid of it. And then they go on, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image you have set up before us. What they were saying is, what John is saying to us, that our worth is determined not by who we worship externally, not the car we drive, not the house we live in, not our job or title or position, anything else. Our worth is determined by who is our God. John made it very clear. Our God is the one who loves us. He sent his son Jesus Christ to live, to die, and to rise again for the forgiveness of our sins and is with us forever and has sent his spirit to fill our hearts with his love and grace. When we look back at the Old Testament story, we see that these three men had that value of who is their God and they were not willing to capitulate on who their God was because it gave them ultimate value. The story goes on. Nebuchadnezzar was livid and angry and absolutely ticked off. And so what he did, he said, I'll show those guys. So he had the furnace increased in intensity seven times over. I mean, he was going to fry them like a piece of bacon. And he got the strongest men he could find to haul them up there and throw them in. Tie them up first. And so they did. In fact, the fire was so hot that it killed the people who took them up there. And Nebuchadnezzar looks into the fire and he sees not three, but four people. One was an angel. They were not tied up, but they were walking around. And when they came out of the fire, they were not burned or singed, and nor did it even smell like smoke. And so God had fulfilled their request and wish that he would redeem them from the fire. And it's because they trusted in this living God that that happened. And yet at the same time as they prayed, even if that didn't happen, they still were not going to worship any other God. And I think that's key for us. Because at moments like this, we can pray and we can want God to answer our prayers. And we should pray with expectation that God is hearing us that he will respond, perhaps not in our own time, but in his way. And that by his loving us, his commitment to us is unfailing. As one friend of mine uh, noted that we sleep. And yet as he was reading through Psalm 121 about being in the valleys of life and the, and the issues of it, and looking up into the mountains, realized that's so high. 
that though we sleep, God never does. And so while we may need something to extract ourselves from the culture around us, God never extracts himself from us. Because he said, I will be with you, and I will be with you forever. I will give you life, and I will give it to you abundantly. It is a reality that as we look at ourselves in the midst of all this COVID, we should stay faithful to him. And then the third step, after acknowledging who gives us value and having our value determined by the one who loves us, by saying we're going to use that value to determine our behavior and we could get into those breathing exercises, breathing in the spirit, breathing in the love of life and breathing out those things that hinder and breathe out those things that love. Third step. When you do something, you realize I, I didn't react as I would have reacted before. I showed love when I wouldn't have showed love before. I didn't blame when I could have blamed before. Celebrate that. Because that's the Holy Spirit changing your life. Because the breath of life is filling you up with his love. At the same time, when it doesn't work, you still react, you still blame, you still blame yourself. Then confess, acknowledge, forgive, request forgiveness. And go back to step one. Value is determined by the one who loves you. And then go back down again. Because the reality of it is, as John made it so very clear in his epistle, if we say we're without sin, that it, that's not truthful. We're lying to ourselves. We're lying to God. So we're going to fail. So don't keep blaming yourself. Recognize that in the midst of it, we can improve because of the power of the Holy Spirit within our life to change behavior. But we will never become perfect. And so continue to stay walking as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, regardless of circumstances, they're going to be committed to God, and God will always be in us and with us because he is committed to us. And may God bless us in the midst of all of the stuff that's going on in our lives. God has given us a sense of hope. Hope because he has declared we have value because of what he's done for us. We have hope because we can breathe in his breath of life and we can breathe out those things that hinder. We can breathe out his love to other people and we can be forgiven when it doesn't work perfectly as we see it should in the world in which we live. We pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our Savior. Amen.